Okay, so this is a little game that we play with some of our registrars calling MR Artifact Catchphrase. Hopefully everybody's familiar with the, uh, the idea behind Catchphrase, where you have a couple of contestants and a picture comes up, and then essentially you just have to say what you see. So in this case, this would be an example of Catch-22. So in this presentation, what I was going to do is give you an example of an MR artifact and then give you a sort of a pictogram to go with that to try and get you to think about exactly what the name of this artifact happens to be. So for example, there's one type of artifact. And say so if this was a little bit more interactive, what I would then probably do is show you that picture to go with it. So now what we would say is that is an example of metal artifact. So there's another plane. So this was actually a three-plane localizer. And as soon as the patient had gone in and the radiographers saw the previous image and this image here, they immediately rushed to get the patient out. So this is just simply a case of metal artifact that arises from an aortic stent. So there's the CT image there, and you can see that aortic stent. And clearly what's happened is that the metal within that stent has done two things. It shielded the tissues from the radio frequency, and it has also caused some uh, local eddy currents as well. It's not ferromagnetic, so it's not being ripped out of the patient, but it's causing local eddy currents generated in there which again have upset the local magnetic field, causing that very large artifact in the middle. Okay, so this is where we really start. So if we were playing catchphrase, we're game on. So the first thing here is exactly what is the cause of this artifact here, whereby we have a failure of fat suppression just at the periphery of the screen here. Hopefully you can see the, the cursor moving. There's our catchphrase picture to go with it. Give people a few minutes just to, or a few moments to think about what that is. So essentially, this is an example of a non-uniform field. And when we mean field, we're talking about uh, static magnetic field non-uniformity. So we have actually have a failure of the fat suppression due to this non-uniformity of the magnetic field. And this is really a issue due to chemical shift. So what we have is that at 1.5 Tesla, water and fat process at 64 megahertz uh, different processional, or at water and fat process at a 220 hertz difference in processional frequency. So the nominal processional frequency for water is 64 megahertz and we can see here that fat is processing about 220 hertz lower than water. This is due to the shielding of the electrons around the protons in the fat molecules. So normally we talk about this difference in parts per million, so it's 3.4 parts per million, and at 64 megahertz, the mega cancels with the parts per million, so 64 times 3.4 gives us our 220 hertz difference. And what we've done here is we've applied a fat saturation technique. And the fat saturation technique is an additional RF pulse that gets applied prior to your imaging sequence. So this is a spin echo sequence here. And what we're going to do is apply a radio frequency pulse, which is centered on the fat peak and has a quite narrow bandwidth of about 150 hertz. So the idea is that it saturates the fat signal and doesn't touch the water peak here. So this is typically the kind of pulse that we have. So it's quite a long duration pulse. That means it's got a narrow bandwidth and it's set about 220 hertz away from the nominal Lamour frequency for water. So that pulse is played out first of all. It's got a spoiler gradient here to deface the signal from fat. In this particular situation, though, what's happened is that the static magnetic field is non-uniform. So here's our fat-suppressed T2-weighted image, and here is our 
B0 field map. So I've actually used a special kind of pulse sequence which allows us to actually look at the magnetic field non-uniformity as a function of frequency offset. So the color code represents frequency offset. So you can see ideally we should be sitting in the middle here with everything round about zero degrees, zero hertz frequency offset from the uh, nominal or more frequency. But you can see just over here on the uh, right of the image that it's actually quite red here or re orangey red, which means that due to magnetic field non-uniformity, we've now got quite a large frequency offset in this region. And because that uh, chemical shift saturation pulse only works on a narrow bandwidth of about 150 hertz, it's not working on this region here where the magnetic field non-uniformity is so large. So essentially what we've got in this slightly different case here is that we've got our fat sat pulse applied over the water peak. But in this case, what's happening is that due to the magnetic field non-uniformity, that fat peak has now shifted out of the bandwidth of the saturation pulse and is now our highest signal, which happens to be at the Lamour frequency. So therefore, in that case, if we just go back whoops, here, because of that shifting, you can now see that the anterior part of this patient has actually arisen now with a poor fat suppression because the fat peak has moved out of the bandwidth of the fat suppression pulse. Here's another example here. This is a high resolution steady state MRA using a contrast agent known as Vasovist, which was uh, for a short while available in the UK. And this has got a fat suppression pulse associated with it. But here you can see we've actually got central signal loss within the chest of this patient. And there's the picture to go with that to uh, give you the idea of exactly what's happened here. So here we've actually got an example of water saturation. And this is because we've now got a very similar process as what happened in the previous slide. But now because of the lungs in the chest cavity here, it's actually shifted the magnetic field uniformity such that the water peak has now shifted in the opposite direction and is now within the fat suppression pulse bandwidth. So what we have now is that the water signal is actually getting suppressed. So that's why we've got this central region of signal loss here. Okay, there's another example of a artifact shown by the arrows. There's my example to try and go with that. As you can probably guess from the picture, this is an example of chemical shift. So chemical shift is a issue that occurs uh, in proportion to the receiver bandwidth that the scanner has selected or the operator has selected on the scanner. So in this case, we've got a relatively low receiver bandwidth. And what happens is that we actually get this physical misregistration of the protons in fat, which you can see here, compared to the protons in a watery tissue. So there you can clearly see that uh, black region there and just here below the kidneys where the fat is now displaced relative to the, uh, uh, the kidneys here in the frequency encoding direction. So that's with a receiver bandwidth of plus or minus 7.82 kilohertz in the frequency encode direction. And here's the same acquisition, or the same uh, acquisition, but this time with a receiver bandwidth of plus or minus 62.5 kilohertz. So in this case, you can see there's actually substantially less chemical shift artifacts in this case. And this is due to the misregistration that we get between water and fat due to the uh, amplitude of the frequency encoding gradient, which is controlled by that frequency encoding uh, 
receiver bandwidth. So in this case, we've got out 3.5 ppm, 220 hertz difference. Here's the frequency encoding gradient with this uh, just under 4 kilohertz bandwidth. And you can clearly see that fat and water are chemically misrepresented in terms of their spatial position from here. So this gain is due because the amplitude of this gradient is equal to the receiver bandwidth divided by gamma and the field of view in this direction. And so if we have this chemical shift effect here, we know that this is 256 samples in this direction here, the readout. Uh, the receiver bandwidth is plus or minus 3.97. And we know we have this chemical shift of 220 hertz from help. So from there, we can actually calculate that we have a 7.1 pixel chemical shift in this case. And if we increase that receiver bandwidth, such as we've got here, so we've gone from the slightly dotted line here, this is now an increase in the bandwidth. We've now gone to 8 kilohertz. So it's a slightly misleading the way I have to draw the diagram here, but essentially that is compared to this axis an increase in the amplitude of the frequency encoding gradient. And then you can then see that essentially that means that the chemical shift is now substantially reduced just because we've now got a stronger frequency encoding gradient by virtue of selecting a higher receiver bandwidth. So therefore, chemical shift is directly proportional to that receiver bandwidth. And by increasing the receiver bandwidth, we can reduce the chemical shift, albeit at the price of a decrease in the signal-to-noise ratio. And of course, if you move to a 3 Tesla magnet, then because we've got double the processional frequency compared to a 1.5 Tesla, then we can see that for this same quite low bandwidth at 1.5 T, we get a 7.1 pixel shift. The identical bandwidth at 3 T now translates into a 14.2 pixel shift. So one of the disadvantages of going to 3 Tesla is that we do get an increase in chemical shift artifacts. Okay, so there's another example of an artifact. Two images here. To see them fading one into the other. So we're actually looking at that sort of black line around the tissues there. So here's our example. Say so what you see, and essentially this is a very good for a fat discussion. This is in and out of phase imaging. So the two images I showed you have two slightly different echo times. They're both gradient echo acquisitions, but uh, one has an echo time of 2.3 milliseconds, and the other has an echo time of 4.6 milliseconds. And that shorter echo time just happens to be at the point in which the magnetization of water and fat processing in the transverse plane actually ends up as a signal cancellation within a voxel that contains both water and fat. So to work out these in and out of phase TEs, the processional frequency at 1.5 T is about 64 megahertz. We have this water fat frequency difference of 3.4 parts per million. So again, if we just multiply those getting rid of the megas and the uh, parts per million on one side, we come up with uh, 220 hertz. And then we know that the fat and water will make a one circle revolution every one over 220 hertz. Uh, so that's 4.6 milliseconds. So at every multiple of these two pi revolutions, so that's 4.6, 9.2, 13.8, we can see water and fat in phase. Whereas at the intermediate value, so the half value here before that, 2.3 milliseconds, 6.9 milliseconds, and 11.5 milliseconds, we will actually get water and fat out of phase. 
So here's an example of those two vectors. So fat is green, water is red in this case. And you can see that as the echo time evolves, the water and fat periodically become out of phase and then in phase.